Impartial, Chapter 6, Treating Everyone the Same, Not Taking Sides in an Argument, Fair and Just. At recess, Jessie didn't waste any time. Evan watched as she pulled index cards, one by one, out of a big envelope. All the fourth graders crowded around. You're the plaintiff, she said to Evan and handed him a green index card that said plaintiff on it. That means you're the victim of the crime. Evan studied the card and then stuck it in his back pocket. A kid's court sounded like a crazy idea to him, a crazy Jesse idea, but he was used to those and this one might get him a new Xbox 2020, not to mention the satisfaction of proving Scott's guilt in front of everybody. For that, he was willing to give it a try. I'm Evan's lawyer, said Jesse, and she gave herself a purple index card that said lawyer for the plaintiff. Then she turned to Scott. You're the defendant, which means you're the one who's on trial. She gave him a yellow index card that said defendant on it. Then she started to hand out five orange index cards. Hey, shouted Scott, don't I get a lawyer? Hold on, you'll get one in a minute, said Jessie sharply. She continued handing out cards. I want Ryan, said Scott. Sorry, said Ryan, holding up an orange card. I'm a witness. Then I want Paul. He's a witness too, said Jessie, handing Paul the last orange card. Everyone who was at Jack's house on the day of the crime is a witness. Well, then who's going to be my lawyer? Asked Scott, crumpling his defendant card. Jessie ignored his question. She held up a purple card. Megan, you're on the jury, she said. Evan's heart jumped. There was one vote he could count on. When's the trial, said Megan. After school, said Jessie on Friday. Megan shook her head. I think we're going away this weekend. You can't miss the trial, said Jessie. Evan wanted to shout the same thing, but he kept his mouth shut. Well, I can talk to my mom, said Megan. Maybe we can leave a little bit later, but you'd better give this card to somebody else. She handed the purple card back to Jessie. All right, said Jessie, sounding disappointed. Take one of these. She handed Megan a white card that said audience on it. It took only took Jessie another minute to hand out the 12 jury cards and the rest of the audience cards. All the audience members were girls because all the witnesses were boys and the jury, as Jessie explained to everyone, had to be 50-50. Evan looked around. It was weird the way all the kids were going along with Jessie's idea. Didn't they know that this was all fake? And how did Jessie know all this legal stuff? How did she always know things that he didn't know? Jessie rounded up the six girls who held white audience cards and then she turned to Scott. You can pick anybody from the audience to be your lawyer. Technically, we don't even need the audience. No offense, said Jessie, turning to the girls. I don't want a girl lawyer, said Scott. Suit yourself, said Jessie, shrugging, but don't come back and complain that you weren't offered legal counsel. A bunch of girls, said Scott, some offer. I'll be my own lawyer. I'll defend myself. He turned to Jessie, and I'll beat you at it too, he said. That was just like Scott, thought Evan, always thinking he was the best, always the kid who had the best stuff, who took the best vacations, who had everything. Good, said Jessie. Defend yourself. There was just one more index card in her envelope. Evan watched as she pulled it out slowly. The card was red and it had one word on it. Jessie looked around like she was making a very important decision, but Evan knew she'd already decided who would get that red card because Jessie never left anything to the last minute. The judge is going to be David Kerkorian. There was dead silence. Then Paul shouted out, are you kidding me? He can't be the judge, said Ryan. He collects human bones. I do not, said David, turning bright red, but stepping up to Jessie and taking the card out of her hand. Then everyone started talking at once. David, meanwhile, held up the red card and shouted, I'm the judge. I'm the judge. They made so much noise that the recess teacher came over to see what was going on. They quiet That quieted everyone. Nobody wanted the recess teacher getting involved. One of the unspoken rules on the playground was never tell the recess teacher what's really going on. Why him, asked Paul, after the recess teacher walked away. Because he's the only one in the whole class who's impartial. He'll be fair. He's not friends with Evan or Scott. He won't play favorites. And that's the most important thing about a judge. David held up the red card in one hand and placed the other one over his heart. I solemnly swear that I will be a fair judge, he said. Good, said Jesse. But Evan couldn't believe it. Who was going to listen to a kid like David Krikorian? For Evan, the day went downhill from there. All afternoon in class, they worked on things that Evan hated. Math drills, spelling rules, and writer's workshop. 
Then Mrs. Overton discovered that one of the jump ropes was missing from the milk crate, and that was Evan's fault because he was the equipment manager. But the thing that really slam dunked the day right into the garbage can, the thing that changed it from a crummy day into absolutely one of the top 10 worst days of his life happened after school. Evan was strapping on his bike helmet when Adam walked up to him at the rack and pulled out his bike. You wanna come over? asked Evan. Can't, said Adam. I promised my mom I'd help her get the house ready for Yom Kippur. Is that today? asked Evan, clicking the buckle under his chin. It starts Friday, but my mom wants me to clean up my room today and do some other stuff. Evan knew that Yom Kippur is a holiday where the grown-ups don't eat all day. It was supposed to help them think about their sins, but Evan couldn't figure that out. When he was hungry, he couldn't think about anything except what he was going to eat next. You want to come to the breakfast party? asked Adam. The Goldbergs always ate a big meal at sunset when the holiday fast was over. Sure, said Evan. He'd been to lots of Friday night dinners at Adam's and Paul's houses. He liked the candles and even the prayers he didn't understand, but mostly he liked the food. Challah bread, roasted chicken, and applesauce cake. Are you going to go the whole day without eating this year? asked Evan. Last year, Adam had bragged that he was going to fast next year for Yom Kippur. Adam shrugged. I might try. Then he looked down at his bike and bounced the front wheel a couple of times on the hard blacktop. Look, uh, there's something I need or I've been meaning to say to you. Remember how over the summer Paul and Kevin and me, we ditched you in the woods that time? Yeah, said Evan, wondering why Adam was bringing up something that had happened months ago. Evan had been really mad back then, but now it's over. Well, I'm really sorry, and I, I hope you'll forgive me. Evan looked confused. Adam shrugged. Dude, it's Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You have to go around and ask people to forgive your sins. Evan laughed. You're such an idiot. He shoved at him and Adam grinned, faked like he was going to throw a punch and then got on his bike and rode away. Evan was just about to push off on his bike when he saw Ryan and Paul walking together toward the path. He crossed the blacktop and crossed in front of them right before they came to the fence. Before Evan could say anything, Paul slung his arm around him, nearly knocking him off his bike. Hey, Evan, I totally owe you one. Thanks for taking the blame, you know, when Charlie got off his leash. Yeah, sure. No big deal, said Evan, shrugging. Evan and Paul did that all the time for each other, swapping the blame so that they wouldn't get in trouble with their parents. Parents always went easier on other people's kids than they did on their own. Want to come over? Evan said to Paul and Ryan, balancing on his bike without pedaling forward. Paul shook his head. No, we're going to Scott's. Evan slammed his feet to the ground and stared at the two of them. He said that we could try out the 2020, said Ryan. It's supposed to be awesome. You should come too. Evan felt like he'd been sucker punched. No way, he shouted. He stared at Paul and then Ryan with an expression that said, traitor, but neither one of them said anything in return. Finally, Evan said quietly, I can't believe you're going over to his house. Paul shrugged. He didn't do anything to us. Some friend you are, said Evan. Come on, Evan, said Paul. You don't even know for sure that he took the money. I know, said Evan. You should come over, said Ryan. Everyone's going over there after school. A picture came into Evan's mind of the whole fourth grade class marching over to Scott's house, all of his friends. And where would he be? He'd be at home with his little sister. Who, he asked. Everyone who? All the guys, said Paul. You know, me and Ryan and Jack and Kevin. All the guys. Not Adam, said Evan, thinking to himself that at least he had one friend that was loyal. Well, he's got to help his mother with some stuff, said Ryan, but then he's coming over. After that, like in an hour, Evan shook his head in disbelief, his best friend stabbing him in the back. He yanked his handlebars away from Paul and Ryan and rode off without saying another word. And that is the end of that chapter.